So, uh, what I'm going to talk about here is the cryosphere. So there are many different components of the cryosphere. We have, I don't know if you can read this at the, yeah. yeah. Yes, yes. So, we, what we have is, when you hear of the ice is melting or the ice is advancing or, or any of this, if you're talking of Little Ice Age or if you're looking at uh, in the Arctic sea ice recently, you have to split it up into the different components. You have the sea ice, you have the ice caps on glaciers, you have glaciers, you have ice sheets, water on the planet. And, the, it, and so, if we move to the next slide, there's, um, you can divide it up into the glaciers, sea ice, ice sheets, permafrost, ice shelves, and snow cover. This is a, um, a map showing the average locations of where the different components are. So you can see the light green is where there is seasonal snow cover. So you can see that Europe and North America have um, a lot of that has seasonal snow cover. Our, the dark green is what's called permafrost, where that's where the ground is permanently below zero degrees Celsius or 32 Fahrenheit. The um, uh, pink bits are glaciers, mount, mountain glaciers, which are permanent ice sheets, but on a particular, like on, typically on mountains. The ice sheets of the, uh, there's one in Greenland and Antarctica, which are almost continental, or they cover an entire island, uh, in the case of Greenland, or continent in the case of Antarctica. So, uh, if you move on to the next slide. Most of you are familiar with the UN IPCC, yeah? So it's the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change. And so a lot of people rely upon this for, uh, in, in the scientific community for their uh, understanding of what's happening in the climate. So what we're finding is that when the trends of the IPCC, when the trends are imply that the ice is melting dramatically. The IPCC is very good at reporting that quite accurately. But we should be looking at all of the evidence for and against if you were to be scientifically rigorous. So in this short presentation, I'm going to look at what we do know about the cryosphere, not just the one. Yeah, not one. Yeah. Good. Yeah, so next, next slide. This is based on three papers that we have um, published in the peer-reviewed literature. Um, the first one uh, that I'm going to talk about is uh, on sea ice. So we published that in 2017 in uh, Hydrological Sciences Journal, and it's a reconstruction of Arctic sea ice back as far as we could go, uh, which is 1901, which has already been mentioned. You should go back as far as you could go. Uh, the second one is a paper on snow cover, which we just published uh, last, uh, like in, was it April, or Ma March or April, in Geosciences. And the third one is the one that Willie was referring to earlier on the Earth's A, on looking at re-evaluating the role of solar variability on northern hemisphere temperature trends. And that's relevant just peripherally, because in it we discuss glaciers and also Arctic temperature trends. So these are the topics that I, we're going to do. So we're just going to look at Arctic sea ice. So this one here, and we're looking at the Northern Hemisphere sea ice. So you can see that's the gray bit up on the top. OK, next slide. So the sea ice, you have the Arctic and the Antarctic. Antarctic is in the Southern Hemisphere, Arctic in the uh, Northern Hemisphere. And every year, in the summer, the Arctic, for each hemisphere, in the summer, the sea ice retreats, and in the winter, it advances again. So, and this occurs for both hemispheres. Obviously, the seasons are reversed in the hemisphere. But if we go on to the next slide, this is what's happened. So, the Arctic sea ice area has declined since satellite records began. The, there's a couple of problems with that, though, when you look at the details. First of all, it's less than the rate at which they've declined is less than half of what the climate models were predicting should have occurred. So these are uh, 
the bottom graph is what's called hindcast. So computer model, the computer models, they go back in time and they say, if we go into the in towards present day, what would we expect to have occurred for the Arctic? And this is what they find should have occurred. It should have been a decline of 53,000 uh, kilometers squared per year. The actual linear trend was minus 23,000 kilometers per square year. But also, if you look, it's a lot more up and down than the model predictions should have been. And the main, that's just one point, but the other point is that the records only began in 1978. And coincidentally, that happened to mark the end of about 30 years of Arctic cooling. So we need to look at it in the context of the further, of, of the longer periods, as, as one of the questions was earlier. Um, and here's a, a, an inconvenient truth. Um, the Antarctic uh, sea ice, the long-term trend has actually been a general increase of plus 10,000 kilometers per square per year. This is day up to now. There's a little drop in the last couple of years, but the long-term trend has been upward. And the, again, the hindcasts have said that it should have been declining at minus 25,000 kilometers uh, per square per year. So, okay, so that's an inconvenient result, we'll move, so let's ignore it for the rest of this talk. Um, the, the Arctic, uh, what happened in the pre-satellite era? There, is, there are some uh, measurements that have been made from explorers going out on ships, from aerial reconnaissance, and from different measurements in uh, icebreaker ships and different things like that. The IPCC decided, you know, to, they used a particular data set constructed from this, which is the Walsh and Chapman data set. So the Walsh and Chapman data set, you see the red uh, bit on the, on the far right, that's the satellite estimate that we had. And for, they added, uh, they stitched onto it this blue, almost flat line going all the way back to 1870. And they, you know, if you were, if, if you were comparing apples to apples, um, then you would say, wow, this is a really incredibly dramatic decline post-1970. And that's what the IPCC implied. But let's look at the Walsh and Chapman if we look onto the next side. There is a problem with the Walsh and Chapman. And it is, there's a, we discuss it in more detail in the uh, paper, the Hydrological Sciences Journal paper. But this is just one of the key points. The, to estimate the past pre-satellite era, one of their main data sets were these maps that were done by the Danish Meteorological Institute. Uh, they were issued every, every month, they would issue this map of their supposed sea ice extent. And so the bits that are in white are supposed sea ice. Um, the bits in red are derived from actual observations. See these bits here? Most of the area didn't have any actual observations, so they were just guessing. And in particular, if you notice, 1952 was at the height of the Cold War. So the Europeans and the Americans were not getting at the Danish and were not getting access to the Russian data. So they just had to guess what was happening. And so if you were at the Danish Meteorological Institute and you said, well, what we tell our seafarers going out there, we're saying there's probably ice, don't, don't assume it's ice free because there might be ice. But simultaneously, the Russian uh, meteorological agencies, they were actually monitoring the ice. So about uh, 10, 15 years ago, I think it was 2007, there was a major uh, digitization of all of the Russian data and a sharing between the US and, and Russia. And this, the, the map on the right hand side is showing what the Russians were observing for the same month as this one that the Danish map was. And you could, I don't know if you can see it, 
they're kind of roughly orientated writing, but all of these blue patches there, where it's, where it's supposed to be ice, it just said there, there could be ice there. So if we move on to the next. So we went and we looked and said, well, you can't just do that. We need to, can't, you can't assume apples, uh, treat apples and oranges as being the same, other than they're both spherical and both fruit. But you, you need to actually try and calibrate the different data sources so that they are uh, giving similar behavior. So that's what we did. I, for brevity, because I know we're stretching on, um, I, we just, the details are in the paper, but basically we took all of the publicly available archived estimates of sea ice, and then we compared them using Arctic temperature records, and we tried to see if there was a consistency between the temperature trends and the um, and the observed sea ice, and we adjusted, <coughs> the, we calibrated the different sources accordingly. This is what we find. This is for the summer, and you can see the CMIP five. This, so this is the 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 sea ice modeled hindcast for sea ice is the top chart, and you can see they were predicting almost nothing and then he, and a gradually accelerating decline in sea ice in the Arctic. The bottom is our best estimate of what's actually happened. Now you can see there's large error bars and hopefully with future work we can try and get more information and improve it. But you can see you have this multi-decadal, uh, the Arctic was was uh, expanding in the early 20th century, then declining, and then expanding, and then declining. And it's not quite as dramatic. It doesn't seem to match well with what the models were predicting should have happened. And just to look up close, yeah, you can see periods of growth, melt, growth, and melt. And technically, and it's a shame that like uh, the person, one of the people that wanted to know about this, this is why I was saying, you know, talking about unprecedented or the hottest or whatever. Technically, if you ignore the error bars, you could say that from 2005 on, it it's, seems to be that colder, the mean is, clo uh, is lower than the earlier one in the 1943. But unfortunately, there's error bars associated with it. So the, you can see that the upper and lower error bars, we, they're all remains within the observed range. So it's what we're saying is, first of all, next slide. The IPCC, when they're looking at snow cover, they, um, this is what they describe. They said, over the last two decades, Northern Hemisphere spring snow cover has continued to decrease in extent and specifically they say it declined over the 1967 to 2012 period and that's one of the key results according to the IPCC summary for policymakers. and I want to say that we could talk about the difference between the full reports and the summary for policymakers, but this is what the summary for policymakers took out as the key result so, they did, another point is they didn't actually mention the computer models in this particular case. Next slide. Why, why did they talk of the spring? Well, why about winter and fall? Well, the top graphs show the winter and fall uh, observed snow cover trends for the entire Northern Hemisphere. And the bottom ones show the, what the model the hindcasts expected should have occurred. I think you can see that they don't match very well. In fact, we've actually had an increase in uh, Northern Hemisphere's snow cover in the autumn and in the fall, or in the winter. So the next slide. The other thing is why pick 1967 to 2012? This is again what we, I was talking about earlier on is you shouldn't be, linear trends are not really a great thing when you have non-linear data. And you can see here that if they had, this is a, an estimate that was the earlier, if you look at it, the trend from the beginning in 1920 of the data up to 1967 was actually increasing. 
and it's slightly increased since 2012. So what we were pointing out, and this is what Michael was mentioning earlier on, if depending on whether you st are depending on when you stop and start your linear trends, you can get any value you want for this. So the next slide. Uh, this is for the annual trends. So this is the average over all four seasons: winter, spring, summer, and fall. And you can see a slight linear trend decline. But it, you notice that the last two years are actually slightly above the the 50-year average, and the climate models expected that it should have been a, a continuous decline from uh, CO2 induced global warming, and that the snow should be disappearing. But it's not. Um, I just I'm thinking because this is a, a much longer one that I. Uh, Finish this presentation now. If if and we move on to the next. So, any questions on the on the cryosphere? Especially here in hot, arid California. Yeah. Of our glaciers melting, can you explain that? So here's the problem: glaciers. They. I don't know. Some people have mentioned there was a little ice age. So the the term little ice age was coined. I made popularized by. Uh, Professor Jean Grove, who passed away in 2001, she was trying to describe the widespread advances of glaciers around the world from 1600 to 1900. And so it was well documented that the glaciers were advancing during for the last 300 years. Many glaciers have retreated since 1900. As you mentioned, there are some that are advancing, some that have remained static. When you average over all of them, they seem to have been retreating. But the problem is, if you look at, these are the total number of uh, glaciers that we have <coughs> lent, uh, glacier lent records for. And you can see that the uh, black, black is from the North Barrier, from the uh, Alps. Alps. The red is, or blue is for the Southern Hemisphere. And the red is for the other regions, within, or the total of them all. So we have like a very limited amount of data, especially as we go further back. Almost no uh, glaciers go back. Most of them stop start in the 1900s and in 1960s. So we are dealing with very limited data. The few glacier records that we have that go back to the 1600s suggest that. You, we were had a period of glacial advance for several hundred years, and then around 1900, it switched to periods of glacial retreat. So we're talking of centennial scale trends. So maybe if you'd look at the next slide. Uh, oh yeah, so you've seen this one. This was the one that uh, Willie was showing. Oh, that one, that one. Yeah, this one yeah. is okay. So just just to show this, this is. Just to show another example of what Willie was saying, when we looked at this northern hemisphere rural composite, we, we compared it to whatever different data sets we could find. And one of them is the estimates of temperatures derived using these glacier, glacial land records. And you can see the yellow is for the northern hemisphere. You can see they're saying it's it, the temperatures decreased, increased up to the up to 1940s, then decreased, and then increased again. Um, so, I, I think because of so much controversy, since the chart is up, I just point that out. That was the fight among those guys. They were saying that we were lying and all those things. They were just arguing for those tiny little portions of the data. I mean, it's just crazy like hell. <laughs> I think maybe... Yeah. I guess, it's, it's yeah. So, um... Questions on that, on this, yeah. I remember reading that because of the shrinking of the northern, uh, northern polar ice cap, that there would be massive opening of commercial shipping lanes. Yeah. And I, I felt that, how do you get any better evidence than that? But uh, I think it was a myopic, they just looked at a short period and then extrapolated yes. it yeah, out. Yeah, yeah. So cool. is there any uh, well, uh, uh, shipping lanes opening that are... No, uh, I will say that if you actually look at, uh, we, we went and studied trying to find old records, you actually can find that a multi-decadal things in the sea ice. For instance, you could go back to people like um, 
you, uh, like uh, Admiral Franklin in the 1840s who went and he reached, um, I think it was Prince Charles's Island in the Canadian Ar uh, archipelago and then, then he got frozen there and uh, it, it, it died, it, it, you know, the whole crew seemed to have died tragically and then the next several years after that nobody could get as far as he was doing so it was a big reward to try and find the crew of Franklin and they, 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 they eventually found the, the in a, by a, a few years ago they were able to get to uh, the place where the second of Franklin's one, they managed to get this, the boat of the, the two ships, uh, only the second one they only got a few years ago. So we have these dynamics. There's another thing of you know, quite, there was a Russian tax collector, Semyon Deznev, I don't, I don't know if I'm pronouncing it correctly, but in the 1640s he used to go to, uh, he to try and get a shortcut he was up at Siberia, and so he said, oh, it might be quicker if I go uh, on from this, uh, up above Siberia all the way around the Bering Straits and get to the other side of Russia that way. And he failed in his first year. The next year he succeeded. And if you, but if you were to look at the path that he took uh, and compared it to the 1978 Arctic sea ice, he said he'd never have made it. I think he would have had to go to up to, um, I think we estimated it was something like probably 2005 in order for him to send on Jan Desnev to reproduce the journey he did in 1640. Mm -hmm. So we were having a lot of dynamic back and forth. Um, any other <coughs> questions on the glaciers and uh, cryosphere or should we move on to the next talk? Yeah. Well, thank you.